Hi, Charlie Kosorek, Jack Bench Woodworking, and today I am on location at a secret location in Green Bay, Wisconsin with Nick Ferry. How How's doing, it Nick? going? Oh, yeah. <laughs> you surprised me with that. <laughs> uh, Nick, thanks so much for having me out to your house. We've been, we had lunch, been shooting the breeze, and finally says, hey, Nick, we got to do the video. Yeah. <laughs> but anyway, um, Nick Ferry, uh, I hope you know Nick, and if you don't, you should. Uh, Nick's got a terrific uh, YouTube channel. He's got a great website. He's got all kinds of cool stuff going on, and uh, we're going to talk about that right now. Well, thank you. I but, appreciate that. But anyway, Nick, so before we get into all the cool stuff you're doing now, you you really have some you know pretty good woodworking. I mean, I'm impressed. I mean, honestly, you do some great woodworking. You've got good skills. And so what's your background? How did Nick Ferry get to be from whatever to, I mean, you have like your dad teaching you stuff when you were a kid or? Well, it, it all started when two people fell in love. Oh, well, we, don't, <laughs> we don't need to go that far. Oh, back. okay. I didn't know no, how no, far no, back. No, no, no. We don't, we don't need the egg story. <laughs> <laughs> the chicken and the egg story. No. Um, I just was always into you know, like taking things apart, mm -hmm. whether they were gifts, remote control cars or... Um, just little toys and trinkets. It, it, there were screws holding it together, uh -huh. so I had to find a screwdriver and take it apart. Okay. And so from a very young age, I just was wanting to know how things work, how they were built, how they were put together, stuff like that. So that's kind of where it started. Very young age, I think I started into like actual like woodworking around like 10, 11, 12, somewhere in there. Okay. So are you the kid that your dad gave you a bike and you took it apart and couldn't get it back together? Absolutely. All needle bearings on the ground? Absolutely. Well, they, these were caged roller bearings, so ah. I, I, yeah, there, there was no needle bearings to <laughs> scatter. But, but no, but there's a genuine story to that. That's why I, <clears throat> I had a bike. Um, it was like a powder blue, and, and I did not like that. So I completely disassembled it, painted it. No joke, flat black. For those that, that know me a little bit, the flat black is kind of a, a theater thing. We'll get to that. But, yeah. Um, and then reassembled it, and I, I was much happier with the bike, the color I wanted it. Cool. So, yeah. Cool. Um, so anyway, you said at a young age, and you really do, you mean a young age. I mean, you had your first little woodworking, we'll call it business, at what age? I think I was 12. 12? Yeah. And, okay, what, what were you doing? I mean, we've already talked about this. I'm a little ahead of the story, but I don't want to. So anyway... Go ahead. It was it was just little knickknack shelves mostly. So did that is that what you called it? Is that the name of the business? Was it knickknack? No, Nick, it was uh, Specialty Wooden <laughs> Crafts. I think was the name of the company. Okay. I think I might even have some business cards yet. I'll have to show you. Okay, good. I would love to see that. Um, and it mostly just knickknack shelves for kind of like tchotchke type items and tchotchke. Now there's yeah. that word again. That tchotchke. <laughs> I understand that's a Yiddish. It is <laughs> the Yiddish. That just, I, who knows where that comes from with me. But, anyways, um, yeah, it was, yeah, just little, little shelves, napkin holders, paper towel dispensers, some little end tables, side tables, stuff like that. But you Not, made a lot of stuff. Yeah, and, but nothing major, nothing so, overly complex. So, what, what equipment were you working with at the time? It was all bench top tools, and yeah. um, I had a, a oddly enough a three wheel bandsaw bench okay. top. I really liked that bandsaw. I wish I would have never sold it, but uh, I had an oscillating spindle sander, belt sander, disc sander, table saw, um, a little planer. But the planer was actually towards the end because most of these items I made out of pine, and I would just get like select pine, uh -huh. so I didn't have to worry about a joiner and, and some of the larger equipment and. Looking back on it, these shelves are they're really, they're kind of just a, an OG, oh, I had a router, because OG bracket, feet, screwed, and then plugged onto a larger board. Okay. And that's essentially, you know, sold a lot of those. Oh, wow. Well, that's good. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Fantastic. So, so anyway, you were, what's that word? Entrepreneur. Uh, and you really, tru you truly do have that going on. Uh, yeah. I've, I've owned a few businesses. In fact, my... I'm, I'm sure we'll get to it, but my last business I had for 14 years. Okay. And uh, no longer doing that. But yeah, it was very much, I always really did want to work for myself or at least be able to have some control that you're limited to um, working for other companies. Now, granted, that's a, that's a mindset, I believe. It's some people like that punch clock nine to five or the shift work or right. they don't have to take that work home with them because right. there's a lot and of steady and routine. You don't have to worry about not yeah. having 
yeah, paycheck. There's a lot. There's a lot of <clears throat> different stresses involved with with owning your own. Uh, but that was that was just always my thing. I always felt like I was a number somewhere else. Okay. So. And okay. And speaking of somewhere else, I mean, it's not like you've always been on your own with your own business. You had a big. You had a job doing pretty high end work there for a while. Yeah, I was. I, I worked in a, a manufacturing facility. Um, where I was mostly uh, a mechanical control specialist, which is a fancy way of saying plumber or okay. piper. Okay. And so anything from mild steel, uh, threaded connections. Some of it was welded. We didn't do any of the welding for the mild or the, the steel piping in house because that all had to pass safety stuff. Yeah. Neither here nor there. But um, bent copper, uh, nylon lines for pneumatics, stainless steel, depending on the application. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So basically anything plumbing, piping. For natural gas, air, mm -hmm. not really much water, but yeah. Well, that's, you know, that's pretty high-end kind of work. Yeah. And um, so you did that for many years? Yeah, uh, four or five years, I want to say. Okay, all yeah. right. And then downturn in the economy or something? Yeah, they, they, well, they, that particular company was notorious for layoffs. Oh. And it was a seniority-based shop, so it was just a matter of time. Okay. Because there was, there was people there that 25, 30-plus years. Yeah. And uh, so, yeah, there was just a, you know, the recession hit and got laid off, which probably was one of the, the actual better things that really could have happened to me because that was good, steady money. Mm -hmm. So good of money that I, I probably would have, I probably would have went long haul on that. Right, right. Um, you know, and so that getting laid off was probably long term much more beneficial for mm -hmm. me because it put me in a position of a of more of a dislike for being just an employee and more if I'm an entrepreneur if it's something that I own I'm the one that's solely responsible for how much business that comes in how much sales that I produce the marketing and everything so right. if I fail it's kind of on me right with them I got laid off there was nothing I could do about it right nothing completely out of your hands exactly yeah but I enjoy I enjoyed working there's that shop atmosphere, there's definitely a camaraderie and almost a whole different language. Oh when yeah. You, when you get when you get shop guys and just <clears throat> just all sorts of practical jokes played on one another. Right. And, yeah. I and that's you know where I really really picked up welding too because I had to weld structural steel mm -hmm. to hold a lot of these gas trains is what they're called. When sure. They're, Main line, pilot line, solenoids, regulators, everything. But yeah. so I had to, you know, weld up angle iron and channel brackets and okay. make sure that they would, you know, pass. All right. But yeah. Cool. Cool. Sounds fun stuff. Like fun stuff for sure. So all right. So you're in this manufacturing environment. Things take a bad turn. At least at the time, it was a bad turn. And what's next? So uh, I applied at numerous places, and then actually one company, I was, uh, I applied to be a metal polisher. Okay. Super dirty job for any anyone that's done any uh, bit of metal polishing. Any kind of metal work at all, really. Yeah. Well, even, polishing even worse. Right. It's just you're covered in black uh, rouge or you know or polishing compound or and it's just yeah. it, everything turns black. They hired me, and the morning I was supposed to start my first day, they said that the guy that quit came back, and then they they accepted him back. So tough luck, Nick. <laughs> yeah, and, and that, was, that was another strike against working for somebody else. Oh, sure. Because I just got laid off. That I had no control over. I just had gotten essentially hired, and I, even I had told uh, you know, everyone that I got hired, and I was, you know. Oh, yeah, hey, look <clears> at me. I got <laughs> Yeah, because it was, it, it was a pretty crappy economy at the time. Yeah. So I was pretty excited. And then they pull a bonehead move. It completely, in my opinion, just, you know, somebody quits and... You know, it'd be like if a star quarterback did that, left and came back, and <laughs> that never happens. <laughs> but so that was like the last straw, and so I said, I'm going to start my own thing. I'm going to, I'm going to do wh whatever it is. Uh huh. Uh, it's going to be me, and that's what I ended up doing. I started. Uh, I, I was a subcontractor for in the in commercial buildings and stuff. So okay. whether you know, uh, mostly focusing on glass, the glazing okay. industry and stuff like that. And I did that for a number of years. And I was hoping for a slow growth with that company, uh, the company that I started, because their growing pains are, are bound to happen. Right. And, you know, if you can have, no, but it kind of boomed. And with, 
within, I want to say a year, I think our gross sales were almost a little over half a million. Oh, wow. And so, so it wasn't just Nick all by himself up there in the ladder anymore. No, no, I had, I had to hire people and, and that was a life lesson. And, and I've said this before to where um, it might not be the best advice, so, but it's my advice. <laughs> okay. Um, you can go to college, but college isn't for everybody. You can go to college and spend a lot of money mm-hmm. and get an education. Right. Or you can do it on your own, and you'll spend a lot of money, and you'll get an education. <laughs> That's one way of looking at it. Uh, I just don't have the the official degree, you know, the, the wall hanger, as I sometimes call it, yeah. at the end. And I'm not knocking secondary or higher education. Not. It's just not for everybody. Well, through the the, the growing pains of that company, mm-hmm. I, I had no idea about business tax and stuff like that, and uh. wasted a lot of money by not buying the right things at the right times. Finally, I landed up. Four or five years into this, mm-hmm. ended up with a good accountant. All right. Went over the books and they were like, you probably just wasted like close to $100,000 in taxes. Oh. Had you, bought a, had you bought a vehicle and did a depreciation schedule, had you, um, you know, handled your, your cash flow or your P&L reports better, or had you, you bought more things to offset the profitability of the business, at least as far as the books are concerned. Uh-huh. And so, yeah, I... Uh, Long story short, I figured, you know, it you was growing. though. Yeah. And, and I mean, at, I think at our peak of a handful of employees, uh, installers, and I had, I've had a very difficult time rel- relinquishing control just because of how, uh, I think that's a problem for a lot of entrepreneurs because they want to oversee everything. Mm-hmm. And that was another learning experience too is uh, my wife works at a company now uh, that practices lean manufacturing they have for many, many years. Uh-huh. But it's that philosophy of find people that are talented at what they do and let them do what they do. Yeah. I, I had a problem with that at the beginning. I, I didn't trust many people, and I just wanted to oversee everything, and that spread my time thin, and 60 hours a week wore on itself rather quickly. Yeah. yeah. So. Okay, so um, you're in the, that con- contracting business for a while, and again, bad turn in the economy or something? Um, yeah, it, there, there was, uh, th- I think this was, oh gosh, I want to say like 07, 08, there yeah. we, we were getting into a recession. And just sales dried up. Uh, my, my business wasn't a necessity item. It was more of a luxury item okay. or a, um, an item that you can have a, a long-term return on investment. So if, you know, if budgets get tightened up, it's one of the first things to go. Yeah. So downsize, had to lay off you know, pretty much everybody. At the very end, it was me and then a part-time guy. Okay. And, but that was, again, it was kind of a blessing in disguise because I found myself with a little bit of extra time, not yeah, a ton. Right. I mean, all while I was doing like theater builds for just kind of extra side money. Yeah. But then that's when I decided I'm going to throw together a couple YouTube videos, uh-huh. see who's got interest in watching them, okay. if, if anybody. I mean, it was... So how long ago was that? So about two and a half years ago. Two and a half years ago. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So that's when you first got into the YouTube videos. Okay, well, let's talk about that in just a minute. I want to go back to theater builds. Yeah. Let's talk about Nick's history, Nick's career with the theater. So, kind of a funny story. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, um, a friend of mine uh, that I worked with in manufacturing always did like theater painting. Uh-huh. Uh, whether it's a faux finish or anything. It, it, the weird thing about theater is you, oftentimes if you start with bare wood, you have to paint wood to look like wood because a lot of your pine or your poplar aspen and it's mostly construction material so a lot of pine a lot yeah. of fir if it starts out that brighter color under stage lights it bleaches it almost and turns it white okay. so if you want something to look dark brown like walnut or or even any type of highly grained wood or cathedral style peaks you have to paint those in there and be pretty dramatic okay he he was asking me if I wanted any help with uh, you know or if, if I wanted to help him paint some of these theater sets so I did uh, enjoyed that I kind of always favored the construction end of it but that came a little bit later uh-huh. um, but then he need, he wanted he needed to audition for a play okay and uh, I said <clears throat> he basically asked if if I would uh, tag along and while he auditioned okay. so I did. Unbeknownst to me, he put my name in the hat to audition, and I had never... So what was your acting uh, history up to that point? Zero. 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 High school plays? Nope. Okay. 
None. I, I did. I did stand up comedy for a, for a while before. You're that. kidding. No. This didn't come out in our lunch. No. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I did. I, w- I had been doing that for almost a year previous with him. Okay. So being in front of a crowd wasn't the problem. Uh-huh. Uh huh. But that was more for fun. It was amateur stuff. I never ever wanted to be like a headlining act. And right. you know that wasn't. And I'm. And quite frankly, I'm not that funny. But. Um, so he signed me up for this audition, and I got up and I read some lines. Long story short, I I got I got a role in that play. Uh huh. And so now, so then you're suddenly committed to actually being in this play and going there every night or something like that. Yeah, yeah. I mean rehearsals and it, it's it's a it's a fairly long time commitment. Sure. But it, it was enjoyable though, to say the least. Uh-huh. It, it really was an enjoyable experience. Mm-hmm. Theater people are some of the nicest people that you can ever meet mm-hmm. because, uh, at least by me, it's not a profession for very many. Less than a percent, right. it's a profession. So a lot of high schools, even middle schools, college level, community theaters, nonprofits, it's because the people enjoy uh, Absolutely. the art form. Community theater, right. Exactly. Right. But a lot of awesome, awesome people. Well, then they would notice that you know I could build you know little things, or they would catch. So they're like, "Hey, can you build this?" And I would build it, and then right. and that snowballed to where I, I almost could do that for a full time job, but it doesn't pay nearly well enough. You'd have to put in seventy hours a week to make a thirty hour a week wage, right. at least around here in, in uh-huh. Wisconsin, or at least my neck of the woods. Right. Just like I said, it's not, nonprofits don't have a ton of money. Okay, so anyway, so you've got, you do uh, some side jobs still uh, with theater sets. You yep. do any more acting uh, with any plays lately? I, I haven't acted in a long time. Okay. Uh, it's not because I don't want to. It's just that is a huge time commitment. Mm-hmm. Even more so, I think, than, than the set building. Uh, because of, by the time they cast and go over lines and blocking and everything, it's a huge time commitment and you're... Yeah, that's probably the only way to say it. It's just what a huge time commitment it is. Uh huh. Yeah, I believe it. So you simply don't have the time to do that. Don't have yeah. the luxury to be. That able and I'm to do probably that right not now. that good. Oh, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> so, okay, but then you do other work too to kind of keep the good ship ferry and going down the road, huh? Yeah. Um. You know, because the YouTube thing is not. It really doesn't. It doesn't pay that. Oh much. come on, man! <laughs> All of you YouTube guys are rolling in it. I saw the big no car out in the driveway. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> we, we go to lunch and he's like, "Oh, uh, we got to." Uh, yeah, I'm like, "You're if if we're going anywhere, you're driving." <laughs> <laughs> no, I mean really, we're we're a one car family. Okay, just joking around, but really, I know, and so do you, and I hope other people re- recognize and realize it. There's not much money in this YouTube stuff, at least not for most of us. Unless you get literally millions upon millions and millions of views. Right. And so, so. so you you do other things to, like, you got it, you got a family. Yep. Uh, you got uh, stuff that, you know, might break <laughs> if it falls down. <laughs> <laughs> so, no, I mean, seriously, but you, you know, we all got to eat, we all got to make a living. Yeah. And so what else are you doing to help yourself there? Well, well, like I said earlier, some people like that nine to five punch clock because yeah. they, they find security in that. That's mm-hmm. their standard, regular, predictable paycheck. And there's nothing wrong with that. Absolutely not. It's just, I did that. I know. <laughs> I, I did it for many years. It's just that was never my thing. Uh-huh. So, but yes, to, you know, I, I, I quit my quote unquote day job right. that I'd been doing for like 14 years. Uh, the, just this past June, June was my last month, and then July, I, I guess you could call it YouTube full time. But uh, we were talking at lunch. No, I, I, whether it's for like little cabinet companies or whatever, if they need a certain item specific made, mm-hmm. I'll make it. Or I do commission pieces. Mm-hmm. Uh, I don't do a ton of commission pieces, and we kind of talked about that. Right. And we could probably talk a little bit more about that, but. Um, so I mean, because that because that was one of the last <clears throat> aspects of um, when I was much younger. I did the the craft show scene, which was okay, but that was getting close. So much batching was getting close to I felt like production, sure. and, and it was boring. Um, and then you know you bring on commission pieces. To me, that all depends on the customer, mm-hmm. and I think I said this on our podcast. But two, two questions should immediately come out when any, anyone ever asks you to build them something. 
and that's what's the budget and what's the time frame or turnaround time mm -hmm. because that'll save everyone involved a whole lot of time and, and you know yeah. headaches because you, you got to meet up on those things before you can even start to talk anything else mm -hmm. so did the craft show scene for numerous years then I'm like, well, I don't really like the batch work. So I'll do some commission pieces. And I did a fair amount of them, but it, I would tend to get a lot of customers that wanted to like pick and choose almost a la carte uh -huh. to where I want this style furniture with this species of wood, with this style door, with this style molding, and approximately this size. And uh, I wanted this stain color with this kind of finish. Production shops do that, right. cabinet shops do that. I didn't like doing that. I didn't, I didn't like that a la carte style. Da, 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 da. I wanted to have my personality into it. And I don't have a wildly unique way of building furniture. Mm -hmm. It's typically arts and crafts, mission, <clears throat> green and green-esque type. Yeah. Uh, I like straight lines, gentle curves. I don't I typically don't do a whole lot of sweeping long and jagged and, but but that, you know, I find customers like that. I had a slight art background to where I would do the, the art shows, whether it's like a couple stretch canvas paintings and stuff like that. Uh -huh. That you can do really well on because the perceived value is completely different. And that market, that customer is really looking for one-off, one-of-a-kind, smaller artist style pieces. Right. And they're willing to pay for that. So you're not just going to... A, you know, a big box or a, you know, big shopping mart and getting, you know, made in China, you know, print that there was a billion and a half made. Right. So that's, you know, but yeah, that, I, I don't do a ton of commissions, but as far as, you know, I'll make a couple cabinets here and there for, mm -hmm. for people if they need them to be a little bit more custom. Uh, a lot of the gigs I have, I don't even have to finish them. Okay. So, because they're, because they're finishing it with, say, a set of other things that they're normally running anyways and it might be like a tinted catalyzed you know lacquer or catalyzed okay. finish so they want the finish to be consistent well that's good yeah so yeah, I, I bring it to great. 150 or 180 uh -huh. and then they do the rest of it okay well so, which is nice because yeah yeah because that's difficult to do in a garage shop it is yeah it is that my, my finish is often dictated and i said this a couple times before but it's often dictated by the season i love spray lacquer i really i like how quickly it flashes how quickly it dries how, how quickly um, you know it, it goes on you can build up coats rather quickly and you know be done but it needs to be really well ventilated well in December when it's you know 10 degrees or zero outside ain't happening yeah I'm not opening the garage door and, and throwing out all the heat that I that I've paid to, to make right. so right. a wipe on poly is more appropriate I think for something like that yeah yeah so okay but all right so just to go back a little bit okay so you are full time with the YouTube now. Yeah, so, if if you well, want, like I said, what re different want, revenue streams and exactly I mean, full not, time into working, building, <clears throat> and creating content. It's kind okay. of a wider umbrella, I guess. Yeah, you're but, right. Yeah, it's really not full time. It's not like you're sitting in front of the camera full time. No. Or editing full time. I mean, you're full time. It feels like I edit full time. Well, yeah, they're a lot of work. <laughs> so, what, how did you term that? That was a good way you said that. What'd you say? Building, making, creating, woodworking, and creating content full yes. time. Yeah. 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 It, it, it probably wouldn't fit on a desk plaque very well. No. What's your title? Well, you're going to need a longer plaque. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so you got other. You got a lot of things going on. I mean, uh, YouTube by itself is not enough to pull the train. No. Not even close. Um, so, all right, so you're doing that. How's it going anyway? I mean, since you are doing it, how are you enjoying it? I am. I'm loving it. Okay. I, this is uh, a lot of people talk these things, and, and you know they're, they're, they seem almost like fluff words sometimes in life. Mm -hmm. But my wife actually said, "You seem happier." Uh -huh. I wasn't even four or five months. No, let's see here. I'm trying to think because it was it it was after June. I want to say a month, four or five weeks, maybe is what I meant to say. But she came up to me. She goes, "You seem happier." Okay. Are you? And I said, absolutely. Right. I was telling Charlie that uh, at lunch that my, uh, what I did for 14 years, it became a job. That's how I knew I needed out. And that was your own business. Yeah. yeah. And, but it was a job. Right. And it, I became very quickly despised to, to, 
you know, dragging your feet. And I understand it's work. It's supposed to be. But uh, I like to joke around because I think smiles are, are, and laughter is really kind of one of the keys to life. I mean, yeah. not to get too, you know, oh, uh-oh, he's getting deep here. <laughs> But why not be in a good mood and smile if you can? Exactly. And all that was sucked out. At, so, yeah. um, I mean, I never started YouTube thinking it would go anywhere. But my wife is actually the one that convinced me on my theater cart. She goes, you better, because we had discussed almost for like a year whether, uh-huh. I, whether I was going to make a video and put it on YouTube. Right. Because when I commit, I really like to commit. Yeah. You know. Sure. And she said, if you don't record that, you're an idiot. And I'm like, why is that? She goes, she goes, I, she knows a lot of the woodworking stuff, terminology. She goes, that thing is going to be a pretty sweet build. Uh huh. And if you don't at least get the footage, you're going to be kicking yourself that you didn't get it. Maybe you don't ever edit it. Maybe you don't ever publish it. Mm-hmm. But you need the footage. And I edited it, and she's like, you, yeah, you got to post this. Okay. This is pretty cool. And I, but it wasn't my first video. I didn't want to start with that one for whatever reason. I'm kind of nostalgic and. Um, you know, a deeper meaning to woodworking. Most of my projects that I make for family and friends, not only do I sign them, but I normally have a short inscription on them. Mm -hmm. So I figured my first project on YouTube, I had my my father, myself, and my oldest son, we built a bird feeder. Okay. And and now I'm going to be doing another video coming up where we build a bird house. Not a complex, you know, mind-blowing project, Uh but it's about the three generations Oh, working together. That's cool. And oddly enough, I still have the hole saw from when my dad and I built a birdhouse 25 years or oh. more ago. And I'm going to use that in the same one. And then hopefully I can give that to my kids that's and say, sweet. Yeah, I mean, that it's a hole nice. saw. It's, it's nothing, but in right. fact, I probably have it. I think it's right in this drawer. But That's nice. Yeah, it's pretty crazy. Okay. So, But then I put out the theater cart build, and that, that one took off pretty good. Okay. A couple people... Shared it and it got way more views than I ever expected. Okay, and it just kind of snowballed. All right, so all right, so that you've, another thing that you've got going that we've talked about or we've alluded to here is the podcast. Yeah. Okay. So tell me more about that. So you're you got the podcast. It's you call it the Woodworking Podcast. The Woodworking, which you know what amazes me. I, Simple. I, I, I like podcasts when I can listen to them. It's hard to find time to listen to them, but. I got, you know, yours is kind of recent. When did you guys yep. start it? Oh, gosh. Um, less than a year ago. Okay. We weren't, we were doing every other week to start, but now we're doing weekly. What amazes me. 19 episodes or 18 episodes What amazes in. me is there's several, at minimum, several woodworking podcasts out there. Yeah. You came on after a lot of them were already in place. Yeah. And the name... The woodworking podcast was not taken? No. How I, come nobody else used that? That was the <laughs> thing, too. First off, I was, we were, I was talking with Jay about it, and I said, there's, there's no way that name's available. Right. And he goes, yeah, I agree. No way. Right. And we checked, and it was. And then, then he was having second thoughts, and he goes, it, it sounds elitist. The woodworking podcast. I'm like, well, no, for one, there's only one E in the. Yeah. It's not ye olde English. It's not the woodworking podcast. Right. And I even, I even called Spagnolo on it, and I said, do you think this is just a cocky name for a podcast? And he goes, no. Right. I he don't goes, either. It, yeah. He goes, it's, it's just how you pronounce the word. It's different regional dialect, you know, whatever. You know, yeah. yeah. So, it's so, okay. So, the anyway, woodworking it, podcast. It's, it's you... Jay Bates, April Wilkerson. Yep, that's that's it. Three and of us. and you know if you if you haven't listened to it, I mean I do like I said I do listen to a lot of podcasts. You guys, seriously, not just you know, saying this, not really. <laughs> <laughs> but no, you guys got a good chemistry on there. You well, really you. truly do. Yeah, and they were. Um, I, I visited, I've been friends with Jay for probably about two and a half years now. Okay. And uh, visited him, hung out in his shop, stayed with him, and we just got a lot, just, just a ton of goofing around. I mean, mm-hmm. granted, there's work to be done, and we get it done. Right. But it's just, it's just fun. So I wanted to reciprocate and have him at my house. And we were doing the podcast, and April, and I said, you're more than welcome. And it just kind of sounded like it, the idea was going to fizzle for a little bit. And then they thought, yeah, let's do it. And we did, and... They were here for I think twelve days. So you guys, you guys all came up here. You did a what? What would you call it? collab? Yeah, collaboration. Yeah, collaboration. And you, and how? I mean, I've watched some of the collab stuff. Collaboration. 
And uh, I had assumed that it was like a weekend. No, uh, it was it was 12 days, uh, and that was probably like the maximum that because we were starting to get probably a little bit irritable. Did they stay at the house with you. Yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. Um, it was really yeah. fun. How many bathrooms you got? Just the two, <laughs> just the two, for them to use just the one. I mean, it, it worked. It worked out pretty well. They're well. They're you know they don't they're not demanding people, but. Um, yeah, it's just that's we we do have that chemistry. We mm -hmm. do get along because we feed off of one another. Mm -hmm. um, Jay and I and uh, April and I were in Kansas City uh, for a woodworking show. We were all in Atlanta for a woodworking show. We uh -huh. just got back from Cincinnati, so it's not like the fr we're not meeting for the first time in real life and. Um, like I said, been talking on the phone and in video chats for years, essentially. Okay. And so, yeah, the, the chemistry's there. They're good people, and they can tolerate my sense of humor. Well, and that's an important element. Here. <laughs> it is. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So, how did you get? How did the podcast get started? It, it started with um, just one night. I was hanging out with uh, Cremona and. Uh, uh, Jay, yeah, and man, it must have been close to three hours of us doing nothing but talking about woodworking. Uh huh. And so I said, "This is a podcast." Uh huh. And they're like, "What do you mean?" I said, three hours we can talk about woodworking and tools." Okay. We're such wood nerds. I mean, we're just like this is ridiculous. Okay. And um, Cremona, there was hush hush at the time, but Cremona was um, kind of going over to to wood talk. Right. Yeah, with Mark Spagnuolo and Shannon Rogers. So he wasn't available. Well, we had talked about trying to balance the two, and we all kind of came to the same agreement that we'd hate to put anyone in a position to talk about, to try and monitor, okay, did I talk about this on this podcast? I don't want to repeat it over here because then it's old information. Right. And I want to make sure, you know, so it just, it, wor it worked out better that, you know, and which is cool. I'm, I'm, I'm super stoked that he landed that. That was yeah, good gig uh, for him. Yeah, uh, and, he, and he does a great job on it. Yeah, and those, yeah. those guys are good people. Um, mm -hmm. You know, so and that was a, just an amazing opportunity. Okay, so now, okay, so it was so you had the talk that you had with Matt and Jay and said, hey, this could be a podcast. Yeah, and Matt wasn't available essentially. Yeah, so we we asked so April. It, that's what I was going to say. So did you know that you wanted three people to begin with? No, but it felt like the, the dynamic would be there better for three um, because dialogue between two is is very, almost, I guess, unidirectional because you say something, I listen, I respond to you. That's right. just that one way. But if you add a third or even a fourth, mm -hmm. it just seems like one person can be listening to what the other two are saying or vice versa. Right. Two people are listening. So you'd, you could elicit two separate responses right. from the one bit of dialogue. It's much more dynamic. It, the yeah. dynamic seemed to, to fit better yeah. Yeah. as far as having kind of a, a more um, entertaining and a more, just more enjoyable mm -hmm. you know, talk. And I think anything over like four would just be people would be talking over each other. Uh-huh. And uh, April was almost immediately excited about the idea and said, yeah, let's cool. do it. And so, yeah, that's, that's how it went from there. And like I said, we started every other week, and then now we're doing weekly. And wow. yeah, it's fun. Well, great, great. Yeah, The Woodworking Podcast. That's Not right. the. <laughs> well, it depends on where you're from. Anyway, so no, at the core of this is woodworking. And you are a good woodworker. It shows in your videos. And Well, thank you. I appreciate that. Yeah, um, and I, I really do believe that. And I think that... I mean, you're, you've got a good personality, you've got the right personality for the videos, but really the, the woodwork, you have to have something there, and there is something there. And part of what you have there that, that interests me, that I'm kind of, I don't know, appreciate, are all of the jigs and things that you use. You've got the, the table saw sled, which is great, yep. and the other day you had your, um, uh, what is that, organizing, what do you call that video? Uh, it was storage. like a workbench uh, organ a storage organizer. Yeah, shop storage, yeah. and you used a, a jig in there with your uh, trim router yep. and spacers, and you know I was just fascinated by that. So I was wondering if you could, you know, maybe you could just show us some of those things. 
Yeah, yeah, okay. for sure. Um, right. Well, you mentioned the, the router jig. Yeah. Um, that was kind of a, a brainchild of, I had a, another organizer that I'm working on, I have been working on for a long time, mm -hmm. and it needed, I forget, it was like, like 13 or something, evenly spaced, consistent dados, almost on a complete four by eight sheet of plywood. And so that was built out of just, let me spend 15 minutes building a jig so I don't have to spend three hours making dados. Right. And it worked, it worked out really well. It just, a it, couple pieces of uh, MDF glued together uh -huh. uh, to basically encapsulate a trim router uh, with a runner underneath that is the, the right offset. So basically you put one dado in the plywood, then you can put the jig runner in that dado and mm -hmm. make subsequent Okay. You, know, you want to make sure the first one is on point because being the, the new groove or dado is going to be parallel to the one you've previously made. Mm -hmm. If the first one is off, say, an eighth of an inch off the run, they're all going to be off an eighth of an inch for the right. run. Right. So, you know, just, you know, taking your time and being diligent about that first one. Mm -hmm. And, you know, and, and, and if you put, there's really no slack in that runner. Mm -hmm. There really isn't. But if you do build it to where there's slack, just make sure to evenly, when you apply pressure in any direction, apply it in the same direction every time, and any errors that you have introduced mm -hmm. aren't going to compound themselves. That makes sense. Yeah. That makes sense. So that, that, works out, that one works out pretty good. My table saw sled, yeah, that seems to be kind of my, my go-to when people think me, because uh, I'd been saving up for a table saw, and I, I've probably owned seven, eight, or ten different table saws. And, I, I didn't want it. I've, I, I've had tons of sleds over the years, but they were just down and dirty. Right. Boom! Give me give me twenty minutes, I'll knock out a sled. Mm -hmm. This one I knew this was a table saw I was going to have for many many years. Mm -hmm. So I essentially made the ultimate, hopefully my last. <laughs> and it not only is a crosscut <clears throat> sled, but there's an insert for it to be a miter sled as well. I didn't want. I wanted to utilize essentially a base with runners. Right. For anything table saw related, yeah. that was my my overall idea, my goal, mm -hmm. and I did that. So I'm not having a complete separate sled for miters, but then also, I just recently made a tenoning slash spline jig. So one, essentially, you're building a really fancy triangle, a uh -huh. right triangle. Yeah. Um, and the the legs of the triangle are they're the same distance, and so the 90 degree to the base you can make your tenons quick and easy. Mm -hmm. The jig costs probably no more than 10 bucks to make. Yeah, and then the slope side uh, you can do mitered splines for you know shadow boxes, picture frames, and stuff like that. Okay, and that works out really good, and people really like that. And that again attaches to my table saw sled, so I'm not I'm not wasting my time with getting more runners and another base. Got it. Um, Another jig uh, that I did on YouTube would be my, I called my dual pendulum router jig. I gotta see this one. Yeah. <laughs> this, sounds, this is already sounding pretty wiggy. It, that one was, a, that was an <clears throat> idea I had for probably close to 10 years. Yeah. But it was just kind of a big time commitment. But, and, and, I, and I wasn't doing the craft show scene anymore. Uh huh. And the idea came to me when doing craft shows. How could I batch out spoons quickly to where, and any Saturday afternoon, I could probably batch out 50 spoons. Wow. And so I came up with it. Basically, is it tilts on two swings or two axes uh -huh. so that you can essentially hollow out or scoop out a spoon for cooking. And then you just run over to the bandsaw and, you know, cut it to rough, you know, size. And depending on if you want it exact or not, but then just kind of sculpt it with a belt sander and you're good to go. And if you got the spoon blanks ready to go and the material prepared, you pop this into the thing, turn on the router, you've essentially dished out the spoon within 20 seconds, cut it on the bandsaw and shaped it in another five minutes, and there you go, you got a spoon in six minutes. Cool. And I, I have batched out quite a few of them already. And if you're giving away as gifts, they're perfect to have laying around the shop. That uh -huh. way if somebody has a baby, gets married, or a birthday you forgot about, that way you have a handmade gift you can wrap a bow on there and, <laughs> and act like you remembered, you know? But Hopefully none of those people are watching. <laughs> <laughs> Probably not. That heart, and if they are, your spoon really matters. That heartfelt, hand-carved, special just for you spoon. That I batched it up in 20 seconds. <laughs> Well, and that's the thing too, on the belt sander, that's kind of, and I, not to, I got like the worst ADD, but 
Um, I did Patrick from Patrick's workshop, his scoops, bandsaw scoops. And it was really, it was almost therapeutic, shaping those scoops at the edge of a belt sander. Uh -huh. And same thing with these spoons. It Get the rough shape and then just kind of, and you can leave a lot of the, the, the kind of roughness and bumpiness and it just adds to that, that handmade touch. And then typically with a soldering iron, I'll just, I'll sign my initials on the end of the spoon and yeah. be all good to go. Cool. And if you're selling them at a craft show, there's no reason you couldn't get 20 bucks a spoon. Hmm. People like the, you gotta have, di that's one thing, you gotta have different price points at craft shows. Uh -huh. You have to have the, the, the plethora of items that are either the 20 or even under $10, the grab and go items, and lesser of the more expensive items. And, and that was one of those, just it was kind of a grab and go item. Uh huh. Yeah. So anyway, Nick, this has been a lot of fun. Thanks so much for inviting me out to your shop. Uh, the, all those jigs, the sled, cool stuff. I love it. And uh, yeah. Yeah, it was my Good pleasure. Time, yeah. Thanks for coming. Thank you. See awesome. You. Let's go build something quick. Let's do it, man. All right. All right. Cool. Now I'm hungry again. I'm having a great time uh, shooting the breeze and um, 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 um. It's hard for me not to fiddle with things. We were talking about YouTubers uh, not having a pot to piss. Oh, okay. This thing. <laughs> I would have kept going, but you looked down. But anyway, Nick, at the core of all this. Yeah. <laughs> and I and I should next time turn my, my phone on vibrate. So I, I will now. Well, maybe I should too. <laughs> Here I am, dear Lord, in the, the year of the Lord, 1900 and, and Samuel. Bibbidi-bobbidi-bobbidi-boopidi. <laughs> <laughs> like, that's not Italian. It's not. <laughs> Shit. <laughs> well, that's all right, folks. That's all right, folks.